Now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, and uh, let me pick it up at uh, verse uh, 16. 2 Corinthians 5 at verse 16. And uh, Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Actually, the verb to be isn't in the Greek, so Paul, uh, that's been supplied in the English. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation That's important to, to remember that for Paul, uh, there is, a, there is a, an affirmation of uh, creation. Uh, and in Christ, we are part of a new creation, uh, bodily and spiritually. Uh, now are we the sons of God, but it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. Uh, so in verse uh, 17, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, many have uh, said things like um, that one of the most uh, urgent uh, tasks facing uh, Christianity, evangelical Christianity today, is the recovery of the gospel. Uh, somewhere out there uh, in the internet world, uh, there is a nine-minute uh, podcast uh, by John Piper, uh, which is called, I think, What is the Gospel? And it was one of those uh, moments, I think, when he was uh, sitting on a stool, uh, and um, I think, uh, if memory serves me correctly, it's, it's at recoveringthegospel.com, uh, and uh, you can hear John Piper uh, answering in nine minutes uh, what is the, the gospel. And it's a very fine uh, account uh, of what are the essential components, what are the essential features uh, of the gospel. I want to focus on this uh, particular section here. I want to see four, uh, four things that Paul is saying uh, here at the close of 2 Corinthians 5. And let me... Uh, let me say, first of all, that the gospel addresses and answers the greatest and most fundamental problem of all, uh, and that is the problem of sin. The gospel addresses and answers the greatest and most fundamental problem of all, and that is the problem of sin. You see, in verse 19, he talks about trespasses. Uh, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against us. Uh, there are a dozen or more words in both Hebrew and Greek uh, for sin. Missing the mark, uh, failing to live up to uh, our created reality, uh, 
crossing a boundary, which is what trespass means. Uh, there's both a Hebrew and a Greek equivalent here of uh, a boundary. Uh, no trespassing. Uh, you know, you drive along uh, in the countryside uh, and uh, you'll see these wonderful uh, woods and uh, there'll be a sign, no trespassing. You're not allowed to get out of the car and wander into those woods. Uh, they're owned by someone else. Uh, there's a kind of implied threat uh, that he's a guy with a, a rifle and uh, he will take you down uh, if you uh, in attempt to trespass, uh, to, uh, to cross over a boundary. And then in verse 21, you have another word, sin. For our sake, he made him to be sin. Uh, sin meaning uh, a, a lack of righteousness, uh, a lack of integrity, uh, specifically the righteousness of, of God. Uh, now, uh, whatever happened to sin? You, know, you listen to uh, uh, celebrities, uh, sports celebrities and political celebrities, and uh, they've, they've always made mistakes. Uh, they make mistakes. Uh, they listen to bad advice, uh, but they never sin. Uh, sin is not, not in their vocabulary. It's not in the vocabulary of, uh, of the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's not in our vocabulary, the world isn't going to use it either. And I think sometimes what distinguishes the church from the world, and uh, I, I understand the desire for... Uh, for uh, redeeming the community and for the church to find itself uh, witnessing within that community. And, uh, but sometimes the church has to be different. And sometimes what attracts people to the gospel is not the fact that you're, you're the same as the world. Uh, you know, um, when the church tries to ape the world, it never does a good job. It's never good enough. Uh, when it tries to ape uh, the world in its, uh, in its music, it's never quite as good. It's not as uh, professional, and it's not as often not as skillful. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's part of my uh, beef with, uh, uh, with worship services that look technologically uh, trendy and so on, but actually they look kind of blah. Uh, you go to a modern movie and your, your every, every sense in your body is shaken to the core by the, just the sheer skill of uh, what Hollywood can do. And then, and then you have an amateur, uh, like the church trying to ape it. And uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think here um, we, we, have, uh, we have the word sin. Uh, sin or trespass. You know, what is the gospel about? What is man's fundamental problem? It's not health. It's not sickness. Uh, it's not cancer. It's not uh, uh, poverty or, or, or inequality uh, or wealth distribution or, or injustice or unhappiness, or the environment. All of those things are important. I'm not denying the validity of any one of those issues, that they need to be addressed. And whatever, whatever the solution is, they, all of those things are, are issues, and they're important issues. They need addressing in some form or another. But that is not man's fundamental problem. Man's fundamental problem is sin. Man's fundamental problem is trespass. That, that Adam and Eve trespassed. They violated God's express command. They did what they shouldn't have done. They transgressed. They broke the commandment. They failed to comply with what God had laid down. They fell short of the glory of God. That's another one of Paul's ways of expressing it in Romans chapter 3. Uh, that they fell short of the glory of God. They fell short of what they were intended to be. 
as those who are created in the image of God and created to express the apex of God's uh, creative uh, ability. Uh, there are all kinds of things, issues, uh, vying for our attention. But the most fundamental problem that we have is sin. The most fundamental problem that we have is falling short and breaking the law and missing the mark. There is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's, that's the wonderful thing about Jesus, isn't it? Which of you convinces me of sin? You know, that he was impeccable, that he was sinless, that he never fell short, he never missed the mark, he never transgressed, he never disobeyed. Uh, he fulfilled the law. He was obedient, even unto death, Paul says in Philippians 2. Right up to the point of death, he was obedient. He obeyed every, every commandment. He obeyed every stipulation. Uh, everything that was laid upon him, he obeyed. Uh, and we are, we are sinners. Uh, we are alienated. Now look at the word reconciliation. Uh, the words that Paul uses in verse 18, uh, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what, what is the gospel? The gospel is about reconciliation. What is it to preach the gospel, to testify to the gospel? And Paul calls it here a ministry of reconciliation. We are ministers of reconciliation. That's what we are. We are instruments of reconciliation. Now, who is the one who needs to be reconciled? You know, there are various ways of talking about the cross. You can talk about the cross in terms of propitiation, which means appeasing the wrath of God, that the wrath of God is, is fully diffused. It is met in full uh, in the blood of Christ, that the sacrifice of Christ exhausts the wrath of God. That's what uh, propitiation means. There's... Uh, there's the uh, word expiation that's sometimes used in the English translations, uh, which is uh, associated with the idea of sacrifice. You can think of the cross in terms of sacrifice. You can think of the cross in terms of obedience. Uh, you can think of the cross in terms of substitution, uh, that, he, that he was substituted for us. You can think of the cross in terms of satisfaction, uh, the words of the Westminster Confession, he satisfied divine justice. It's how the Westminster Confession views the, the cross. There are lots of ways of viewing the cross. One of the ways of viewing the cross uh, is redemption, uh, the payment of a redemption price to redeem the firstborn. Uh, a price had to be, had to be paid. So, so we are redeemed, the ransom price to set us free from bondage has been paid. Now, the word that Paul uses here is another word, reconciliation. Now, who, this, is a, this is a term, you know, some people argue that in, uh, in our post-modern or, or late modern world in which we live, certain words uh, have become wholly unfamiliar to the world. Uh, the more secular the world gets and, and the more removed it gets from the worldview of the Bible, the more certain of our terms and phrases and language don't convey and don't mean anything. Uh, the world doesn't fully uh, comply, certainly, with the, the word propitiation. I mean, who uses the word propitiation? Hands up, those of you used the word propitiation in a sentence in the last uh, couple of weeks. And yet, it is, the only, it is the only English word, the ESV has returned to using the word propitiation to translate the Greek uh, hilasterion um, rather than what the NIV had said, a sacrifice of atonement, because it didn't fully convey what, what hilasterion meant. Hilasterion has to do with exhausting the wrath of God, and a sacrifice of atonement didn't convey that idea. And that's what propitiation actually means. So the ESV has reintroduced the word propitiation into the English language. It means that people like you and me need to use this word and, and bring this word back, at least within the Christian community, back into, into familiarity again, because, the, because it's an inspired Holy Spirit word, hilasterion, and, and therefore it's an important word. 
and, uh, and, and we, need to, we need to use that word. We need to learn it and use it and become familiar with it. Um, but our society, our world is much more attuned to uh, a word like reconciliation because it's kind of therapeutic. Um, most, most of us, and, and I'm one of them, uh, have been raised in dysfunctional families. I know what it is to want to run away from home as a teenager because my parents were uh, in complete disarray. Uh, I, uh, I, know, I know the anguished cry of a teenager uh, that some angel would appear and fix my parents' relationship, uh, which ended up in uh, divorce. And, uh, uh, so I, I don't want to be 16 for all the tea in China. I, I don't want to go back there. Uh, now, the, I, I don't think I need therapy. I, the, gospel, the gospel undid most of what was wrong. Uh, and, uh, um, but I understand the language of reconciliation. Uh, when two people are out of sorts, when there's uh, animosity... Uh, when there's bad blood, uh, when, when, when there's tension. Uh, you walk into a room, actually, sometimes you walk into a church. Actually, you know, ministers see a whole lot. You know, pastors, they look down and they see a couple and body language conveys tension. Uh, and I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, pastors sometimes see that. And uh, sometimes it's, it's all too visible. Mm, things are not going well there. Uh, and uh, there's tension, and there's a need for reconciliation. It's a beautiful term. Who is it that needs to be reconciled? And, and, and we, think, we think that what Paul is saying here is that we need to be reconciled to God. Right? That the animosity is on our side, and the animosity is certainly on our side. But actually, for Paul, the animosity is on God's side. God needs to be reconciled to us. His holiness means he cannot have fellowship with us. His righteousness, his absolute integrity means he cannot have fellowship with us because light cannot, cannot have fellowship with darkness. So the animosity, the, the, the problem, if you like, is not just on our side. The, the problem actually is on God's side. His holiness his justice, his integrity. Now, in the, in the medieval uh, era, uh, when, when they asked questions like this, uh, the medieval uh, theologians uh, asked the question, could God forgive sin if he so chose to forgive sin? Could he Could he? have just forgiven it. You know, once, once he has set the plan of redemption into action, then, then we understand Jesus has to die and sac be sacrificed and be raised and, and so on. But could he, you know, in the councils of eternity, could he, because he's all-powerful, his will is absolutely sovereign, could he have just willed salvation into being? Just willed it by divine fiat. And you understand, uh, speculative as that question is, but if you, if you sort of travel the road whereby you, you raise the sovereignty of God and you raise the sovereignty of the will of God higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher so that the, the ultimate thing in all the universe is the will of God, you can end up answering that question in the affirmative. Now, you may say... Uh, that's typical of the medieval age, but actually there were some reformers and Puritans who went down that path, and uh, one of them was John Owen, and the early John Owen answered that question in the affirmative, and, and then repented, and when John Owen repents, he repents. So he writes a thousand-page book on the vindication of justice, arguing the opposite, and he writes it in Latin. Uh, just to prove the genuineness of his repentance here. Um, uh, the question certainly is speculative, but uh, uh, I think the question has to be answered entirely and wholly in the negative, that there is no other way for God to forgive sin. There is no other way for him to be reconciled because 
because holiness demands that law be satisfied and that transgression be punished. Now, that's, that, that's countercultural because that's not where our culture is. Our, our culture is that you must forgive and you must forgive unconditionally and that idea has crept into the church of unconditional forgiveness. Actually, I don't think that's where the Bible is. I think there are conditions for forgiveness, and one of the conditions is actually repentance. Uh, that's another issue for another uh, time, uh, for sure. Uh, but that's usually the way we treat our children. Uh, we are willing to forgive. There is unconditional love in the sense of, uh, I, I love you, but I'm not going to confer forgiveness here. You're not going to get whatever it is I've taken from you. You're not going to get it back until you actually say, I'm sorry, and say it with meaning. And not, just, and not just the words, but actually convey that you actually mean it. Now, that's, that's the way most of us have reared our children uh, here. So here's the issue of, uh, of reconciliation. And my point is that the gospel addresses and answers the greatest and most fundamental need, and that is sin. We have a huge problem. We have a massive problem, and the problem is sin. It's the problem of the world. It's the problem of every individual in the world. You know, what's wrong with the world? That great question that was asked at the beginning of the 20th century by the Times uh, newspaper, the editor asked for uh, literary figures and philosophers and theologians to respond, do you remember, to the Times ed editorial question, what's wrong with the world? And there were long pontifical essays written into the Times over a number of weeks uh, by some very famous names. And then G.K. Chesterton uh, wrote and said, Dear Sir, I am yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Right? The problem is me. What's wrong with the world? It's me. It's my sin. It's my rebellion. It's my transgression. It's my lack of holiness. It's my unrighteousness. And the gospel addresses that. You know, so what is the gospel? As we talk about what is the gospel, and, and I think the first thing that the, the gospel must address is the issue of sin. Sin that needs to be forgiven. Now, the second thing is that the gospel is fundamentally something he does for us. Uh, the gospel is fundamentally something he does for us. It addresses, in other words, the issue of inability. Now look at the language here, and then let me, let me go off on a tangent and then come back to the language. But look at the language. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, that, that, that language is conveying the idea that the gospel is about what God does. Right? It's not about what we do. It's about what God does. Who addresses the problem of sin? Who fixes the problem of sin? And the answer is God. Right? There is an act of divine sovereignty. There's an act of divine monogism in the gospel. The gospel is not a cooperative. It's not synergistic. It's not a little bit of me and a little bit of God. It's entirely of God. It's God alone. God does this. God fixes this. And he does this apart from me, apart from any contribution of mine. Now, what the gospel addresses, and let me get more theological here for a minute, what the gospel addresses is the issue of inability. Sin renders us unable. Sin, original sin, the imputation of Adamic sin, we are born sinners, we sin because we are sinners. Right? We're not sinners because we sin, we sin because we are sinners. I'd say, say that six times and, and make sure that you understand it after the sixth time. We sin because we are sinners. That's what we are. That, that is what we are by disposition. 
right, the dispositional complex of, of our fundamental nature is towards sin. We are born in sin. Right? That's how David writes in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. I, I came into this world not with a clean slate. I, I came into this world a child of Adam. As in Adam, all die. And so the New Testament says we are dead in trespasses and in sins. We're not, uh, we're not just in ER. We're not just on a life support uh, system. Uh, we are dead. There is no heartbeat. There are no brain waves. Uh, there is no will that will respond. Uh, in terms of free will, we don't have free will. We have free agency. Uh, we act according to our natures. We make choices that are in accord with our natures. Uh, but we don't have the power of contrary choice. Uh, that, that power has been lost. Uh, we are, by nature, dead in trespasses and in sins. Uh, Jesus, uh, speaking uh, about uh, those in Jerusalem, how often uh, would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks uh, beneath her wings, but you would not, right? They would not. Uh, they, they have no ability, the problem of inability. We cannot, uh, we cannot save ourselves. Now, at one level, um, the problem is sin, but at one level, as we've been saying, the problem is God. Uh, the problem is um, the holiness of God. The, the problem is uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Jonathan Edwards' uh, sermon. Um, God cannot bend the rules. Uh, God cannot make exceptions. That's what holiness means. That's what perfect righteousness uh, means. You know, the rich young ruler. Here's a young man uh, comes running up to Jesus and says... Uh, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What a question. You know, that's happened to me once in uh, being a minister for 36 years. Uh, I, think, I think that's happened to me one time in 36 years. A uh, lady, uh, she, um, we'd hired her. She was retired. She, she, she uh, wanted to uh, clean the church. Uh, Part-time job. She'd come in a couple of afternoons a week and... Uh, you know, she'd vacuum the carpet and clean the, the ladies' room and so on. And, and, uh, and uh, she lived in the neighborhood. Uh, she could walk there. Um, so we hired her. And uh, I went to visit her one day. And uh, long story, but let me abbreviate it. It, it became apparent uh, she, couldn't, uh, she couldn't read. Uh, it's you know, a very strange phenomenon, unlikely phenomenon in, uh, in the late 20th century in Britain that uh, you'd find somebody who actually couldn't read. Uh, so she couldn't read the New Testament. And uh, living in the same street was a, one of our members, roughly the same age, also a widow. I said to her, look, I, I don't want you to let on uh, that you know that she can't read, but why don't you go over there one day and say... Uh, that you have, uh, you just have this uh, love for, for reading, and would, would she mind if uh, she would come over and just read a chapter of the Bible with her a couple of times a week? Uh, that's all you need to say. Uh, don't, don't ask her if she can read or anything like that. Don't embarrass her. And that's what happened. And uh, she did that for a while, and then one day I went to visit this lady, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the room, and she, she plops down on her knees, and she says, Pastor, I want to be saved right now. You know, every Calvinistic fiber in my body was saying, not yet. Uh, there are 16 more steps that we have to go through yet, because I'm not, I'm not sure that you're ready for the gospel. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then I remember the New Testament, and I, I prayed with her, and, uh, and she, she received uh, Christ, and I, I truly believe she became a believer. And uh, she's in heaven now. But um, that's only happened to you one time. Uh, that, uh, that, that kind of scenario. But what did Jesus do with a rich young ruler? He, uh, he took him to the law, remember? He took him to the Ten Commandments. He took him to Sinai. 
Now, who, who in their right mind uh, in, in presenting the gospel takes somebody to Sinai? Right? Somebody comes running up to you and says, what do I need to do? You know, what, how can I be saved? And you say, believe in Jesus. Right? Believe in, say the sinner's prayer, repeat after me, and, uh, and then give them a Protestant absolution. Uh, go and sin no more in omni patri et trinity et spiritus sancti. Amen. And uh, they're in the kingdom, and it's one more notch on your belt. And uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus didn't do that. He took him to the law, and this young man said, all these I have kept since my youth up. And you think, uh, what kind of schmuck is this? I mean, who, who says, who, who thinks that they've obeyed the Ten Commandments completely from their youth upwards? Well, the answer is, most people do. You know, because that's their understanding of what keeping the law means. You know, I'm, do no harm to others. That's what the Ten Commandments mean. You know, so long as nobody gets hurt. Right? That's, that's the philosophy of life. That's the one commandment. The greatest commandment is, so long as nobody gets hurt. Um, and and that's, that's where the majority of people are at. They believe that uh, they've done enough. Whether, whether they have a, a, a view of God uh, but, or whether it's just a naturalism in terms of uh, their relationship to other people, uh, it's, they have no concept of sin. They have no concept of transgression that involves punishment, that involves consequences. Actually, it's, it's quite interesting because in terms of their understanding of civil law, especially if their person is hurt, they want vengeance, right? Uh, which I understand. Right? And they, they can't rest or they say, they say I, I can't find closure right, until the person is caught and until he is sentenced and until he is sent to prison. And only then, when justice is seen to be done, can I find closure. And... Um, Jesus says to this young man, he's rich, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Boy, that hurts. And uh, he went away. And Mark says, you know, he loved him. It's a beautiful statement. He loved him. But he let him go. And we have no idea whether that man is in heaven or not. We have no idea whether he, he came to faith later or not. We, we have no idea. Um, evangelism, you know, my, my, my question sometimes is, uh, and as a minister I get asked all the time about, uh, about um, you know, methods of evangelism in the church, they're always, looking for, they're always looking for quick fixes, they're always looking for a program, because we're all salesmen by heart, and uh, we want, we want, uh, we want the, the simple way to get people into the kingdom, so give me, give me, the, give me the program, what are the, what are the two things, the three things the four things I need to ask uh, in order to secure a win here. And, uh, and Jesus let him go. Uh, he, he let him go. Um, he had no concept of sin. Right? He had no concept of need, really. And until you have, a, uh, uh, until you have an understanding of your need, actually of your inability. Have you, have you been brought to the point where you say, I have nothing to offer. I have absolutely nothing to offer. I have no obedience to offer. I have no rule keeping to offer. I, I have no performance to offer. N nothing in my hands I bring. It's worse than that. Because it's not just that I haven't done anything worthy of offering. It's that I can't. I'm unable. The problem of inability. And the problem of inability, Adamic inability, inability that is the result of original sin, is that all you have then is God. All you have is God. You're locked up 
Right? You're, you're, you're corralled into a corner here, and all you have is divine monogism. All you have is divine sovereignty. God must take the initiative. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that what Paul says? While we were yet sinners. It's not when we had repented, Christ died for us. When we had shown enough motivation, Christ died for us. It's when we were sinners, when we, when we were in our condition of total inability. God is, uh, verse 19, God is reconciling the world to himself. This is something God is doing. Or verse 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin for us. Now, uh, do you notice there, um, who is the he who made him? Who is the he and who is the him? You know, he is the father and him is the son. The gospel doesn't work. Actually, the New Testament gospel doesn't work unless it is Trinitarian. Right? The Trinitarian nature of God manifests itself in everything that God does outside of himself. Right? If you want it in Latin, ex opere operato trinitatis indivisa sum. Right? It's one of the statements of the early church, that the external operations of the Trinity cannot be divided. So whether we're talking about creation or providence or redemption or judgment, all of these external operations are Trinitarian operations. Now sometimes we present the gospel by saying that the Father is somewhat reluctant. You know, he's somewhat grumpy and grouchy and, and, and really doesn't want to save us, but Jesus woos him. You know, he, 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 he displays this extraordinary, extravagant death and, and wins from his father something of a, of a reluctant love toward us. And that may be our experience of our earthly fathers. And sometimes we imprint all of that on the New Testament. But the New Testament is the exact opposite of that. The New Testament says, you know, what is, what is the most well-known text in all of the Bible, at least in the 20th century? You know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who is the God who loved the world? It is the Father. The Father's love sends his son. He sends his son. He did not spare him, but freely delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? The, the gospel is fundamentally then something God does for us. Thirdly, the gospel centers on the life and death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, it also includes the resurrection, for sure, and it also includes the ascension, and it also includes the session work of Jesus at the right hand of God, and it includes his second coming, and, and so on. But fundamentally, absolutely fundamentally, the gospel centers on the life of and especially the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He knew no sin. Let's go to verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. It begins with the sinlessness of Jesus. The absolute sinlessness of Jesus. He wasn't guilty of Adamic sin. He didn't inherit original sin. Some people have argued that he didn't inherit original sin because he had no earthly father. A view that uh, began with Augustine, that in the virgin uh, birth, uh, there, is, there, is no, uh, there is no Joseph DNA in Jesus. Uh, no one at any time said about Jesus when he was two that he looked like Joseph. Right? He looked like his mother. He had the same eyes as his mother, same chin as his mother, same hair color perhaps as his mother. Uh, but no one ever said, no one ever said he looks like Joseph because he didn't look like Joseph. There was no Joseph DNA in him. But of course that's insufficient to argue for the sinlessness of Jesus because he inherits at least 
at least 23 of the chromosomes in his body come from Mary. The other 23 come from the Holy Spirit, but at least 23 of them come from uh, Mary. But, but Mary, uh, which is why the Catholic Church uh, advocates a view known as the Immaculate Conception, which is not the Immaculate Conception of Jesus, but the Immaculate Conception of Mary. So to get, Mary, to get Jesus sinless, you make Mary sinless. Uh, and of course, uh, how is Jesus sinless in the sense that he doesn't inherit original sin? And that, I think, uh, the only answer to that is that that's a sovereign operation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ensures the sinlessness of Jesus. But neither did he commit any actual sin. You know, as a two-year-old, or a four-year-old, or an eight-year-old, or a 13-year-old going through puberty, or an, or a, or a, uh, an 18-year-old, uh, uh, 21-year-old, as a fully grown man, at no point did he transgress God's law. He fulfilled every demand. He was obedient right unto the point of his uh, death. He knew no sin. And then Paul says God made him to be sin. Uh, the language there, the verb, is legal and forensic. Uh, God, God um, reckoned him. Uh, he made him to be sin. In other words, in a legal and in a forensic sense, he was, he was reckoned to be a sinner. He was declared to be guilty in the legal sense. God federally, covenantally, judicially, reckoned him to be a sinner. It's, um, it's the language of imputation. Our sin was imputed to him. He became our substitute. Right? So it's, it's substitutionary atonement. It's, it's, uh, it's the language of imputation. Now look, go back, go back, to verse uh, 19. You know, the gospel is not that God doesn't count our sins against us. Look at verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. Now, the gospel is not God doesn't, God doesn't count your sins against you. That's the gospel. No, the gospel is God doesn't count your sins against you because he counts them against his son. He counts them against his son. The justice that sin deserves was met in full, but it was met in his son and not in you. He took the punishment. He took the penalty. He took the blame. Right? The gospel isn't just that God forgives. You know, the gospel is God forgives. That's not the gospel. The gospel is God forgives at the expense of his son. Because justice has to be done. Sin, sin has to be atoned for. Violation has to, be, has to be punished. God is just. It's, uh, it's the great exchange, isn't it, in verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our sins reckoned to his account, his obedience reckoned to my account. The great exchange. Jesus was made, reckoned, the greatest sinner the world has ever seen. He was the greatest sinner the world had ever seen. So that in him, we might be perfect. We are reckoned law keepers. Federally, legally, we are reckoned law keepers and covenant keepers. There is absolutely nothing that bars us from fellowship with God. We are reconciled. We are embraced by our Heavenly Father. He comes with the cloak and puts it round us. He kills the fatted calf. 
Uh, he announces a party. This, my son was dead and is alive again. Uh, that's, that's the gospel. And the gospel is about substitution and it's about satisfaction and it's about a great exchange. You know, in Yom Kippur, uh, there was the ritual of uh, the two goats. You know, one, one uh, sin was, was confessed. You put your hands on the, on the head of the goat, you confessed your sins. And somebody took that goat and took him out as far as you can see, and then some, and it was left there. Right? It was gone. It was taken away. You couldn't see it anymore. And then the other goat, a knife was taken, and its throat was cut, and it was killed as a sacrifice. And it was just a picture. It was a little, a little storybook picture in the old covenant of Jesus. And our sins are taken and they're removed and you can't see them anymore. They're gone as far as the east is from the west. But at the cost of his death, at the cost of his sacrifice. You know, who killed Jesus? Who killed him? You know, was it the Jews out of envy? Was it, uh, was it Pilate uh, out of uh, spite? Was it, uh, was it Judas out of greed? No, it was the Father who killed him. It was the Father who killed him. God, the Father, so loved us that he did not spare his own son. So the gospel centers on the life and especially the death of, of, uh, of Christ. You know, if you're asking, you know, what is the gospel? What are the basics of the gospel? It's about uh, sin. It's about inability. It's about our inability to save ourselves, to do anything, to promise anything, to perform anything. And it's about Jesus. It's about the Father loving us and providing Jesus as our substitute and sin bearer and satisfier. And then fourthly, the gospel brings a fundamental change in our status. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, what are we in Christ? We are the righteousness of God. What are we in Christ? Perfection. What are we in Christ? Law keepers. We are as righteous as Jesus is righteous in Christ. We are as spotless as He is spotless. We are as pure as He is pure. That's our status. That's who we are in uh, the gospel. My, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I see it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Now, uh, time has gone again, uh, but, but I'm, I'm trying to think through what are the basics, gospel basics, and I think this passage provides us with, with, with fundamental gospel basics. But now comes a problem, uh, and it's gospel and law. And uh, I want to think about that uh, at, uh, at 11.15. So we've got a 15-minute break now, but let me pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you again for these extraordinary, wonderful truths of the gospel. We, we know them. We think we know them. But we want to know them every day. And we want to repeat them to ourselves every day. When we wake up in the morning, we are in Christ. We are forgiven, adopted, reckoned to be righteous, justified in a right relationship with you. And all, and all because of what he has done as our sin bearer, as our substitute. You made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that in him we might be 
reckoned the righteousness of God. So grant us your blessing now as we spend some time together. We ask it in Jesus' name.